Welcome to day four of Children's Advocacy Week. I hope um, you gained new insight from our elected leaders and advocates that have joined us throughout the week and are inspired um, and inspired each of you to create change on behalf of kids and families. While we're waiting for everyone to join, um, please use the chat feature to say hello um, to everyone that's here. And thank you all for joining us today um, at our justice policy discussion with legislators. I'm Mehet Kalra with Kentucky Youth Advocates. I'm the Chief Policy Director here. This is our third sector-based policy discussion with elected leaders. Today we have a long-standing champion for kids joining us, Chair of Senate Judiciary Committee, Senator Whitney Westerfield, representing Christian, Logan, um, and Todd counties. And we're doubly excited not only to have you, Senator, but also to celebrate our first blueprint um, priority bill, Senate Bill 36, that you've championed past committee this morning. So very excited about this. Um, and the goal of today's discussion is really to hear about justice related policies and also to hear from Senator Westerfield about the 2021 legislative session and why we need to hear from you as an advocate. So we'll be taking questions and comments through the chat feature and we'll, we'll try them as we, um, we'll answer them as we go or um, afterwards. So now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Courtney. Thanks, Mahek. Hi everyone, my name is Courtney Downs. I'm a policy and advocacy director at KYA. Uh, I lead our juvenile justice work and our child welfare policy work. Um, and I'm really excited to have the opportunity to speak with you today, Senator Westerfield. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I tend to learn a lot from people when they're given the space to just like kind of introduce themselves. So do you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself, your background and, and who or what called you to public service? I was a young boy in Western Kentucky, brought up in the hills of North Christian County. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> thanks for having me on. Um, <clears throat> we did have a great success. I'm glad to see Senate Bill 36 uh, come out of committee this morning. I've already spoken with Chairman Massey. Uh, getting ahead of myself, it's got to pass the Senate floor now, but uh, I feel confident it will because it has before. Uh, and I, I expect Chairman Massey will give it a hearing as soon as he can once he gets to the House. So I'm excited to see that. But um, really, my, my juvenile justice work <clears throat> came in my first year on the job here. Um, and it started with Senate Bill 200, or, or even before Senate Bill 200, but Senate Bill 200 was the first big product of it that we passed in the 2014 session. Uh, but it started in 2013, and someone said, hey, Whitney, there's this um, this task force that was created in 2012 when I was too busy running for the job uh, to know that it was going on. Uh, and I was told uh, by uh, different folks that uh, there was an effort to sort of scuttle whatever that group came up with in terms of recommendations. And it was sort of a half effort put into it by uh, at least one member of it. And it sort of tanked it. And I thought, well, I, having had some exposure to uh, the juvenile court docket a little bit, particularly on youthful offenders, because I was an assistant Commonwealth's attorney. And so I would prosecute a very small handful of those cases that came to us in the circuit court. Uh, so I had some exposure to that and to the juveniles that were treated as youthful, youthful offenders. I had time as a GAL in family court um, right up until I started this job uh, and I was familiar with the inner workings of uh, DCBS and the court system and uh, the criminal dockets, both the district and circuit court. And when I realized that this group had been put together and it sort of fizzled, I said, well, let's do it again. So the very first thing that uh, I think I, it was the very first bill I ever passed, it was a Senate concurrent resolution 30 something. Uh, and it was, uh, a, a resolution to recreate or reconstitute that juvenile justice task force. And we did. And then, then Chairman Tilly, uh, my good friend John uh, there in Hopkinsville, um, we worked together and, and got Pew to come in and everyone knows the, the history there. We were able to, to have a really aggressive uh, meeting schedule over the interim of 2013. And what we came up with using Kentucky's old numbers and finding a lot of places where Kentucky didn't have good numbers, we came up with Senate Bill 200, <clears throat> which has then gone on, as you all know, to be used in a number of other states. Old chapters of it, sections of it have been borrowed by uh, West Virginia and Kansas and Tennessee and uh, Utah and um, uh, a handful of other states I'm drawing a blank on. And 
as as I've ended up spending a lot of time talking about juvenile justice issues, the other issues have, have bubbled up related to the juvenile criminal justice space. Uh, and the biggest one at the top of that list, one that we did not tackle in Civil 200, uh, but one that we certainly have a problem with, I do in Christian County, where I'm from. Uh, it's a big issue in Jefferson County and Fayette County uh, and other areas around the state, but that's the racial disparities we have in the system. And they are, uh, they're there. Uh, we have uh, populations of black and brown kids that at a greater share than their, their share of the population are getting hit by different parts of the system. Uh, and they more often don't get the benefit of, of diversions or the, the benefit of uh, an easier hand in the criminal justice system. Uh, it, it's harsher for them uh, at every point in the system. And then there are still places where we can't identify certain things because we don't have the data. Uh, and so at that, that's been the mission ever since Senate Bill 200 uh, came and went. Uh, it's been working on trying to find policy grounds that we can advance to identify, uh, to gather data. We still haven't gotten that bill across the finish line, uh, but the agencies are complying with that request I made way back when, but to gather the right data, to inform the best public, public policy decisions going forward, uh, and to advance a handful of bills like Senate Bill 36, uh, where we already do have some data that shows the disparities that are there that we can address. With a, with and in Senate Bill 36 is a case of pretty small edit, relatively speaking. Uh, so there's there's a whole lot of work to be done, and that's just the juvenile space. I know that's what you are worried about, but you can find uh, racial disparities in the criminal justice system, in education, in health, uh, in uh, the workforce, in, in economic uh, strength. You pick a subject matter. Uh, or a policy area, and you can find racial disparities there. It's why I'm also excited to be a co-sponsor uh, of Senate Bill 10. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing a permanent fixture of LRC uh, have a, an eye on um, the gaps in, in minorities' access to opportunity. Can you maybe talk a little bit more about what's in Senate Bill 10? Because one of the, the questions that I yeah was gonna ask you about was, I mean, obviously at KYA, we're always talking about what gets measured gets changed. Um, and, you know, we're well aware that there uh, are the racial disparities, not only, like you said, in the juvenile justice system, but in the criminal justice system, and then all of the other systems as well. So um, can you talk maybe a little bit more about that? And then also <coughs> more broadly about like what you've tried to do legislatively to address these issues or what, what you think needs to sure. be done to address them? Well, about Senate Bill 10, I'll give you some context. First, let me freely admit, I think Senate Bill 10 doesn't go far enough and it's not enough action. I'd love to see more policy work, substantive policy changes. And Senate Bill 10 is, doesn't go uh, the distance I'd like for it to go, but it's still a big win. In earlier mid-December, whenever the Senate Republicans had their caucus retreat here in, in the Capitol Annex, and we have that every year, we just we hear issues related to the budget or whatever, and we all the members have a chance to share issues that are important to them. And we have a, a, a packed two days of, of policy discussion. Uh, and it's it's enriching and it's maddening at the same time because you, sometimes you hear things you don't like. Uh, I never dreamed that the Senate Republican Caucus in my time here in the Senate would ever acknowledge racial disparities and do anything about it or care to do anything about it. But we did. We spent a couple of hours, more than the agenda allotted for uh, for that subject, and we heard from uh, some people on staff and others uh, about racial disparities that exist. Uh, we, we talked about uh, the protests uh, over the last year in Louisville. We talked, and, and around the country, we talked about uh, the importance of acknowledging that there are racial disparities. Uh, and to give you some further context, you all know at KYA that Senate Bill 36, that automatic transfer language existed previously in a bigger bill, Senate Bill 20, that I had filed a couple of different times, a couple of different years in a row. The first time I filed Senate Bill 20, which has now been three or four years or so ago, I actually had a member of the legislature tell me to remove references to disproportionate minority contact, DMC. Just bring the bill, just strike every instance of those three words out of it. Now that's a term that's been around for decades. Federal government uses it. State governments around the country use it. It's, it's not a term I created. or it's, it's been around because the problem's been there. 
but there was so much resistance that, that I was asked to take that out. And so there was a version of the bill at one point that removed all references to DMC, silly as that is. So we've gone from that to a bill that creates a permanent body of both legislators and, and folks outside of government to explicitly look at the divide between the races on key issues and key areas in, in state of Kentucky. Criminal justice, education, uh, workforce and economic uh, development, uh, health, <clears throat> and that group has been tasked specifically and given the power, specific power to, uh, to take testimony, to seek information, to uh, obtain whatever it needs, whatever documents and records it needs, whatever data it needs. I love that phrase, Courtney, that whatever gets measured gets uh, changed. I love that because uh, that's true. And there are still places where we aren't collecting enough of it to identify places where we can make statewide policy changes. But that's to see any movement at all is a huge deal. And I didn't think we'd ever do that. And I, my, I was the first one to speak up when we were having that discussion. And I commended our folks talking. <clears throat> I commended the members. Um, and I, and I, I praised the fact that we were spending any time on it at all. And as the, as the father of two brown kids, pretty darn important to me. Because I know what kind of world, I know what kind of world I see that they're growing up in right now. And they're still relatively at six and three, uh, ignorant to the, the truth of the world that's around them. Um, but that won't stay that way forever. And I want to make it better. Um, and they're not the only uh, black and brown kids in Kentucky. And we need to do that for, all of them. Um, so I'm Senate Bill 10. I, my one hope, and I've, I've said this before, my hope is that it it's not just a, an opportunity to glad hand and, and rub elbows. I want us to, and I've asked to be on it, assuming it passes, I've, I've asked my leadership to please put me on the group. I hope I get on it if it passes. I want them to come up with specific policies. I want us, if, it's a, if I'm on it, to produce specific recommendations for statutory changes, or, or maybe even recommending things that are outside of government that maybe local government should do, or maybe um, the private sector should do. I don't know. I, I just want it to be a productive group, because if it, if it doesn't produce the, that sort of output, then it's, we don't need just another meeting, for goodness sake, uh, that doesn't produce specific things the legislature can and should act on. Thank you. I forget what, what else you asked me about. You, no, was <laughs> all about Senate Bill 10. Now I can't remember the other thing. No, I, I was uh, I was just asking about the racial disparities and what you what you've done before. What you think needs to happen? <clears> well, I, I would direct people's attention to Senate Bill 20. There there are a couple of different things, and and some of them are not even related uh, to race, but but juvenile justice generally. Um, and I've talked with KY, with you all at KY about this before, but a minimum age of criminal responsibility is something we've talked about. Competency of a juvenile. Um, there are discussions about um, even Senate Bill 36. One, some of the changes that I would like to see, it, I would like for 36 to have gone further than it does. I would like, and prior versions of it did, or at least that have been floated around, but not that have gone through. I'd like to see that youthful, that, that YO transfer only apply to crimes against uh, people. Uh, I'd like it to see, or maybe only for kids that are a certain age or above and raise that age. Um, truly, uh, there's an argument to be said that there shouldn't be a youthful offender process at all uh, for any juvenile. I mean, if you, if you genuinely believe that juveniles, that kids are kids, uh, it doesn't mean that the conduct doesn't get a consequence and there's not a response that's meaningful and appropriate to whatever action they do or whatever criminal conduct is involved. But if we believe kids are kids and not adults, then we should, we should treat them as kids and not adults. Um, uh, there are, as I mentioned, there are uh, disparities in, um, in diversions or in uh, the opportunity to, we just, we, we continue to see that minority youth aren't given the same breaks that, that white youth are. They end up deeper into the juvenile justice system than their white counterparts and at a greater, faster clip than their, than their white counterparts relative to their share of the population. Um, and then from a, a bigger perspective and not a unique specific policy, we just need more data on it. Mm -hmm. I'd like to codify what, what I asked for 
in the first Senate bill 20 years ago was for the, the big agencies of AOC, the courts, uh, part of education, DCBS, to gather specific data on race, uh, race, age, gender, all that. And a lot of that they already gathered, some of it they, they didn't. Um, and others made some changes to that bill that, that I was less enthusiastic about, but was still willing to do as a compromise. Long story short, the bill never passed. And so I, to my knowledge, these agencies, unless they've got a federal obligation, are still not under a state obligation to collect certain data. I want us to have it. Mm -hmm. I want us to, to collect it so that we know exactly how many juveniles we're dealing with uh, that are minority and how the system's dealing with them at every point possible. And again, some, there's a lot of changes I think we can, ex, uh, can explore from a statewide policy perspective, but there may be some that are outside of state government's purview but the data can show us that, or at least suggest where we should look next. And without adequate data, we're just, we're so much of what we do up here, and you all know this very well, so much of what we do up here is fixing a knee jerk reaction to something 20 years ago. Yeah. We, we just can't, we can't legislate to the, the one edge case or the, the knee-jerk reaction is to just be really harsh to all kids because of the one bad case that happened somewhere else. We can't, mm -hmm. can't do it that way. And we need the data to show us what to do next, or at least to better inform what we ought to do next. Yeah. Well, thank you for, for sharing all of that. And, and honestly, for just being this unyielding advocate for these important issues and for some of the most vulnerable kids that we have um, in the state. Um, I kind of... I haven't done as much as I should have done. Well, I appreciate you saying that, but I, I haven't done as, as much as I should have done. You've done a lot though, and it's it doesn't go it doesn't go unnoticed or unappreciated. So thank you for, for everything that you've done and continue to do. Um, we know that you've had a lot of success and and um, it's not I guess it's fair to say that it's not really uncommon. I think you talked about the progression before, so it's not uncommon for things to take a long time um, to pass, like long. legislation to pass. Um, are there, are there any like barriers or challenges that you can speak to around passing juvenile justice legislation? <clears throat> Two come to mind immediately. Um, one is uh, the issue of race generally. So when I talk about Senate Bill 36, when I talk about the bigger Senate Bill 20 that I have filed in the past, race has been an impediment. You've got some who are very, even in that caucus meeting, there are some who are very uncomfortable, very uncomfortable because they, they don't believe this is a real issue. So, the, and, and there are, uh, there were comments made in there that are very troubling. Um, so I, we're not out of the woods yet, but the fact that we had the conversation is good. Um, so that's still an impediment because there are still people who believe that uh, black kids are just more prone to commit crimes than white kids, which stupefies me, but that's, that's an impediment. Yeah. Um, the other one uh, that most immediately comes to mind is what I just talked about a moment ago, and that's the, the edge case, the outlier case. So um, when one kid, uh, I'll give you an instance from the adult system, uh, but you can apply this because this happens in the juvenile system and it happens in every state. If you were to poll every legislator in the country, uh, particularly on criminal justice issues, this would show up. And I, I'd, I'd be surprised if it didn't make their top five of issues that get in the way or obstacles that they've got to deal with. In the adult system, we've had a conversation for years about bail reform or pretrial release reform of some variety. These are people that are sitting in custody pretrial, so they're not convicted of anything yet. The Constitution guarantees and requires that they are innocent people, but they're in custody for various reasons. And there's a, there's a boatload of, in fact, the first week of December in 2019, Kentucky had 7,300 or so class D nonviolent uh, pretrial people in custody around the whole state with no holds for some other charge. That's a bunch of people in Kentucky who are innocent under the constitution still, but still sitting in a county jail somewhere. So we have this conversation about bail and every time we talk about amending who's entitled to this sort of release or whether or not they should be out or whatever, people, the prosecutors, law enforcement, judges, all of them, they talk about the one guy who some judge let out because they were a low risk, they didn't think they would flee, they didn't think they'd hurt anybody, 
And this actually happened in Louisville where a guy that was a low or moderate risk was let out a year or two or so ago and he went out and killed somebody else or killed more people. Uh, and I don't remember the, the, the total facts of that, but he was let out on a pretrial release and did, did something horrendous. And everybody's worried that that is going to be what happens in every case. So if we were to do something on juveniles and we were to, the, the, there was questioning this morning on Senate Bill 36, and there was some heartburn about, are we eliminating the shall on all cases? Um, are, we, are we only still allowing the shall if they use the firearm? Like, no, we, the objective is to get rid of it on all cases. If they still want to transfer it, they can. But we're going to get rid of the mandatory transfer element of it. And there's still some reluctance because people are thinking about the one kid that did the one horrible thing that one time. I can't tell you how often that comes up in the juvenile justice space, in the criminal justice space, and in, in the, the age of criminal responsibility issue we've talked about. The, the, situa the example I've heard multiple times is the eight or nine-year-old kid that does something because we've I've talked about and have filed bills or had drafts of bills at 10 years old and 12 years old. I've, I've plumbed the depths of LRC staff and NCSL staff. It's the National Conference, National Council of State Legislature. Um, for any sort of scientific data that backs up doing it at this age or at that age, because I'm just arbitrarily picking it. Uh, and at 10 years old, we're talking about single digits of kids, but the long story short, when I bring it up, people still talk about there was a case out west where some eight or nine year old kid killed everybody in her family with a gun or with an ax or something just got awful. And they say, well, Whitney, we, that, that kid needs to be in detention. They need to be detained. I'm like, well, maybe for their own safety. But I think the bigger problem is that they've got behavioral health issues. There's a psychological problem or a, a behavioral health problem of some kind. And locking them up doesn't accomplish addressing that. It makes you feel safe, makes the community perhaps feel safe, but it may not be the best thing for that kid, even in that horrific situation. But they all think all kids, it's possible that any kid might be that kid. And so when you think about when, so when you talk about putting a minimum of age of criminal responsibility, what they hear is that under that age, there is no criminal responsibility. Uh, and that's true, but they can't get that one kid out of their mind. That's a huge obstacle. Even, that, even if that kid is objectively and demonstrably a, an extreme outlier, an outlier's outlier, that's still really hard to shake. That's interesting that you say that. And I'm, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking too about, okay, so not only does that impact if we wanted to, you know, one of our blueprint items is establishing that minimum age of responsibility, um, but then we also talk a lot about parental incarceration. And so you could see that that would also have an impact on kids whose whose parents, you know, are being locked up on like these low level nonviolent offenses. Um, and so it would have a, a tremendous impact on on like both ends of that that spectrum within the justice system. So it's really interesting to hear more about. Um, let's go ahead and transition because I know we just have like a few minutes left. Um, as Mahek, uh, mentioned earlier in the in the opening that Senate Bill 36 have the hearing and passed today. So congratulations. Um, I'm going to assume that most of the people who are listening are familiar with Senate Bill 36. You can talk about that a little bit if you want. But are there other bills that that you're sponsoring um, this session that you'd like to to lift up for everyone? The only other big bill, and I haven't filed it yet, uh, and I'm going to use. I, I've got one of my bill requests uh, set aside for this. And that's a, a, the data piece of Senate Bill 20. Uh, I'd like to file that maybe even today if I can get it jacketed, if not on, on Tuesday. I'm still concerned about the time. But the jumbling of, of legislative days has presented a problem. Um, can't blame it on COVID because we're all still here and we're, we're getting things done, but using those eight days up front um, and being here only three days this week and I think only three or four days next week, it it compresses things and, and makes it more complicated on top of the fact that our committee meetings are now an hour. We got those five bills out of committee this morning. And if I had to bet in advance that we were going to pull that off, I, there's no way I'd have put money on that. Um, so my concern is that we, we may be short on time to get that through. I still have those agencies are still, so far as I'm aware, still gathering the data that I requested just by letter a few years ago. So the need isn't nearly as, as important as it once was, but um, 
I still want that to be codified. Yes, Mr. President. I do. I do. I'll be there soon. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. You're fine. I'll be there. Okay. Uh, on the criminal justice front, that was a very important walk in from the Senate president. So. <laughs> Okay, so we're, we're wrapping up. Um, more broadly, as I said, we do uh, focus on parental incarceration as well. So what can we expect just in the Senate judiciary? Like, what can we expect to see? Or what are things that advocates maybe should be aware of that could potentially be coming through? Huh. <clears throat> well, um, I'm not sure on juvenile justice issues. I'm not sure what else is out there other than Senate Bill 36 and, and the data bill uh, mm -hmm. once it drops. And then of course, Senate Bill 10, which I think impacts the juvenile justice system as much as it does the adult system. And I still haven't seen, I, I don't know if Senate Bill 10 has been referred to a committee yet or if state and local government, I, I don't know what the status of Senate Bill 10 is, but um, I would make sure uh, that you reach out to your legislators uh, in both chambers to push for Senate Bill 10 or Senate Bill 36 uh, for whatever bill number my data bill will end up being. I haven't seen anything out of the House yet on juvenile justice issues at all. Uh, and Chairman Massey hasn't mentioned anything coming out of there. Uh, there is some, uh, I've heard that there may be some effort to do a minimum age of criminal responsibility. And if one comes forward, I would support it. I, I'm, I'm open again. I've asked for some, any sort of data that would justify setting it here or there or here, but I'm open-minded about where that should be, but I like the idea of, again, responding appropriately to the, to the juvenile the way the system should. Um, so I, I would encourage folks, when you see those bills, uh, look, at the, look at the LRC's website and check the index, listen to KYA, because they're checking that stuff every single day, and make sure that if it's one of their blueprint bills that's been out there or that's just been filed, because we haven't hit the filing deadline yet, I think that's Tuesday. Um, or, or sometime next week, keep an eye out because even things filed on that last day still have a shot. Um, I think it's less confident, but I, it's still an opportunity, especially if there's been any effort on the brand to advocate. So make sure you communicate. And, and I guess one bit of advice unsolicited is, and I mean this generally about any sort of issue, you, if you don't already have a relationship with your legislator, you need to do that. You need, to, you need to reach out and connect personally with your legislator because they're your legislators. You've got a House and a Senate, Senate member. You need to know them, and they need to know you so that when you do reach out, and for the love of Pete, don't send a form email. I don't know if those work for anybody else, but they absolutely do nothing for the Senate Judiciary Chairman. I don't care who it is. Don't care if they're in my district or not. If all you did was click twice, on some website to send me an email that looks like the thousand I just got from somebody else, I'm not moved. I do not care about what your form email just told me to do. And I, I just, it, it doesn't persuade me at all because if that's, if this is all the effort you care, then that's all the effort you're telling me you care. Um, but if I get an email or a phone call or a text message from somebody that I know and I trust, when my, when my, Children's Advocacy Centers are, uh, around the state and including Penarol uh, and at Brass uh, over in the Barron River area when um, and Brad, or Brad Brass is the sexual assault uh, uh, facility and sanctuary in Hopkinsville. And um, when, when those advocates reach out to me directly, they text me because I've gotten to know them. They know me and I know them and I, their message hits loud and clear and they're influence with me is immeasurably more than a dumb form email uh, or uh, a mean tweet. That's, Build that's those crazy. relationships because, man, that makes a huge difference. I mean, it just makes a huge difference. It does to me. That, that, that I trust the input I get from the people that I know and I work with and, and that I have a good relationship with. I distrust the junk that I don't get that way, or I, I'm more apt to distrust it eventually. That's the, we just put in the comment, that's like the tip of the week <laughs> for the advocates. It's like, just skip the form letters and try to develop those relationships. 
Um, is there a specific way that you prefer to be reached out to by your constituents? Every legislator is different. Uh, if I know you personally, a text message is fine. If, if not, an email is fine. I get them all. Um, I see every single email that comes to me. Um, unless I'm getting like a gajillion and they're all form emails, and then I set up an email rule to get them out of my inbox. Uh, but even then, I've seen the, the subject and, and enough of it to know what it's about. Mm -hmm. uh, I just am not particularly moved by it at all. But emails and phone calls and text messages, and one day when we're all back to normal and vaccinated and mask-free or just we're not locked down like we still are, you can come see us. Uh, see us in our district. See us here. Um, we'll come to see you. Ask us. We invite if you own if you've got a facility, you operate something. Take us on a tour. Show us what you're doing. What, and then again that you're impressing on their mind. And the next time they've got a budget vote, or the next time something comes up that affects what you're doing, at least you you're without excuse. Yeah. You know they've got they've got reason to know what it is that that their decision is impacting, good or bad. Well, those are all the, the questions that I have for you today, Senator. Thank you so much for making the time to, to meet with us and for all the information that you shared. And, and again, for your, your advocacy and for being such an amazing champion for some of the most vulnerable kids that we have in the state. It is. Well, I, I appreciate that. God has provided me with an opportunity to have this seat for four more years, and I, I pray I get to enjoy it and use them all and to do good work. I hope I've done good work before now and uh, I've got four more years to try my best to do some more. So I, I'm, I'm thankful uh, God gave me the opportunity to do it. I appreciate y'all having me on. Thank you. Thank you for making the time. Thank you. See you guys. See you, everybody.